Hi, folks. Good morning. Let me pull up our agenda. And I think we can wait for a little bit. Hey, Matt. Good morning. Hey, good morning. I was logged in as the wrong me. <laughs> that happens to all of us. <laughs> so do we have um, Zane presenting? Oh, we do. There he is. There he is. Awesome. Hey, how's it going? Hi. Good morning. Good morning. I brought my good camera to work. Awesome. <laughs> stuck with the stuck with the one built into my LG panel. If you can uh, please add yourselves uh, in in terms of on the um, on the dock then we can take notes too. All right. I think we can wait, wait for another minute and then um, the first objective really uh, was to See if folks had any areas that they wanted wanted to cover. I know we have Zane, uh, who actually uh, will be presenting on the um, application for Pixie and uh, application for. Um, uh, I think let me pull up the uh, link for, for incubation. Yes, yes, the application for incubation. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't complete my sentence. I was looking for a link on the. Uh... No worries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here it is. Okay. We have the African Pixies, exciting times, Pixies application, or intuition. All right, I think we can, uh, it's five minutes past the day, uh, over to you. Let's uh, get started. And um, so let's, I, I, I think, um, did we want to step through the, Matt, did we want to step through what we have on the doc itself that is on the PR? Uh, for the incubation stuff? Yeah, Zane. Oh, I, I have a, a little short presentation and demo that I'm happy to do. Uh, we can also walk through the doc. I, I don't know what the regular formal process is. Yeah, I think I think we do both uh, because what we have done in the past is that we actually uh, enable uh, everyone to kind of provide comments if they have, everyone has the link, but also then uh, step through the demo and any other highlights of the features that you want to call out for the, 
for both from a um, technical, you know, feature implementation standpoint, stability, guarantees, uh, readiness for the project, as well as anything else you want to highlight from the community. Yeah, I'm, I might be able to provide a little context too for those who are somewhat new or haven't seen the the move from sandbox to incubation or or that be, or, or even entering the sandbox. I'll just say briefly, um, Zane, you probably know. Was it two years, two and a half years, some number of years ago, um, when when Pixie joined the CNCF sandbox, um, uh, Richie Hartman and I uh, were asked uh, by some members of TLC to you know um, have a look, and that's a norm that's a normal thing for uh, a tag in a domain uh, to 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 review and or provide feedback. Um, so you know this is kind of a success story, at least in my view, right? We've seen Pixie grow through the sandbox and gain steam and gain contributors and gain, gain adoption. Um, uh, and now they're applying for incubation, right? So um, uh, I kind of threatened, I don't have it prepped for today. I'll put it out in the next week probably, but um, Zane, I think you've been, is it you, you and or Michelle or some of your colleagues have been at the tag, I think six times um, over the years. Uh, and so I'll, 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 I'll provide a, a manifest of links, but I would love to hear sort of um, how the project has evolved and matured or changed or grown or whatever, um, whatever, whatever the case may be uh, from the moment, you know, um, from, from your time in the sandbox. And then, you know, like what, what is different now that was, that, that wasn't there at the outset. Um, and, and maybe if you could just even provide some commentary for others that might be interested in having a project take a similar path and, enter the sandbox and, and gain contributors and, and whatnot um, that, that might help as well um, just to set the tone. Uh, okay, that sounds good. Let, lastly, I'll say there's um, lots of projects across all of the tags frequently will, as part of a application to incubation to the TOC, um, give a presentation to the tag. Uh, again, I have to be clear, not because the tag is a decider or an arbiter or in charge or anything like that, uh, but because it's it's an assembly of of, of interested eyeballs and 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 craniums. So uh, you've got the floor, and 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 we're thrilled about it. Okay, awesome. So what I'm going to do is I'll just pull out the application first, and then we'll just walk through that. Um, and then I have a short, I don't know, like five or ten slides or something, uh, followed by like a short demo. So that seems reasonable. Yeah, I think uh, so. I think we can probably get through it all in like less than 30 minutes. Cool, cool. Yeah, Zane, definitely go for it. Okay. All right. So let's uh, start a fun thing to zoom stuff over here. Okay, great. And, you know, I'm happy to give this informal. So just ask questions as they come up. Um, so at a high level, uh, fixed season observability tool for Kubernetes. So I think our, our high level pitch is that we use PBPF to go and automatically collect all your information, like all the, the applications information, and then present it to you in like a, a scriptable, easy to use way. Uh, we also use all the Kubernetes metadata to like reconstruct things like services and what resources there are and, uh, and, and such, and just make it easy for you to do like drill downs inside of the UI. Um, everything inside of Pixie is collected and stored internal to your cluster. So we don't actually ship anything out. Uh, if you want to ship something out, you can use our OTLP system, uh, or sorry, open telemetry system to basically go and egress to any open telemetry endpoint. Uh, so it's completely out of scope for Pixie to be able to do long-term retention. So we're designed to be short-term data collection, make it easy for like debugging what's happening in your cluster now, and you know maybe for a few hours back. And if you really care about anything long-term, then it'll work some of it. Um, so we joined the CNCF sandbox actually in June 2021, um, and we've seen a bunch of growth in our community and adoption. Uh, full disclosure, Michelle and I both work at New Relic, so New Relic is actually building a product on top of Pixie, but there are other companies like VMware, um, Secret, Brain Cover, that are basing their, you know, large part of their projects either on top of Pixie or as part of like the Pixie ecosystem. Um, we also have other adoption like Verizon, et cetera, is like basically using uh, Pixie as part of their, their uh, web. 
Uh, in terms of our community right now, we have about uh, 1,300 Slack members, 50 plus contributors, and about 245 commits a month. So that's kind of the high level how uh, we We don't have a sponsor yet from the TOC. Um, and then in terms of adoption, you kind of have a list of like all the high level adoption things that we know about or that people have reached out to us about. Um, so there's stuff from AWS, EKS Blueprints, uh, AWS Managed Safana uh, using Fixie, uh, Fixie Workshop on EKS. Uh, Fixie is part of New Relic's uh, Kubernetes offering. Um, and then the Verizon Fixie Edge. Uh, there's also uh, stuff on top of Fixie like CloudWatch auto, auto instrumentation with Pixie, uh, doing chaos engineering with Pixie. Uh, so a lot of these tools like use Pixie to collect data and then use that data to like drive uh, their other their other systems. Um, we have done a bunch of talks at Kubecon. Uh, some of them have been done by our team. Some of them have been done by community members. Uh, so this one was like Natalie uh, who works at New Relic as well. Um, this one over here, reproducing production issues with eBPF. This is done by Matthew Array, uh, who is the CTO of SpeedScale. And SpeedScale is like a uh, testing system that's basically built on like capturing API data and then allowing you to like replay API data. Uh, and they use Pixie to capture some of their API data in the key here. Um, tracing SSL with eBPF. Uh, this work was done by Dom and he was on Twitter. Uh, there are a couple of folks at Twitter who contribute to Pixie. Uh, Dom actually now works at New Relic. So he, he used to be out at, at Twitter, but he actually joined, um, joined the New Relic team. Um, this one was about doing dynamic logs inside of um, inside of your application. So you can go use eBPF to go and pin and launch. logs. Um, and then, uh, you know, sending Pixie data over to Prometheus. This is another uh, community talk. Uh, in terms of like our development process, um, everything is done on GitHub. We track all our issues on GitHub. We have pull requests on GitHub. Uh, this is actually a change from when we applied to Sandbox. Um, Pixie wasn't an open source project from the beginning. So we used to do all of our development on Fabricator before. Uh, so over the past like few months, we have moved everything over to GitHub. So you see, as Fabricator and Jira, we moved everything over to GitHub, including GitHub issues and um, GitHub PRs. So that makes things a lot easier for the community to interact with. Um, we have several different releasable components. Uh, so the first one is the control plane. So this is what hosts. Um, some people call it the Pixie Cloud. So we're actually trying to rename it to the control plane make it less confusing for, for folks when they hear a cloud. We don't want to think about it as like a paid offering or something like that. Uh, so the control plane allows you to do is basically manage multiple Pixie instances and allows you to host the UI and be able to access data from any of your clusters. Uh, we have this thing called the Vizier, which is a monitoring backend. So this is the part that actually gets installed in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, there's a Kubernetes operator, which sort of manages the deployments. Uh, and then there's this, you know, APIs. We have uh, first class API support in Go and Python. Um, and if you want to use some other language, you can use their native gRPC library. Uh, and then we have a CLI. Uh, so right now, the control plane utilizes like a date based scheme uh, because we typically do a release once a week, uh, sometimes more often. Uh, we'll probably move this to semantic versioning in the future, but it's because this is more like a continuous development uh, pipeline, uh, the date based scheme works well for this. Uh, everything else in Pixie is semantic version. Uh, so, you know, typically uh, we don't break APIs and stuff unless we document it. Um, and even for the semantic release components, we typically release them once a week, uh, sometimes more often. Um, we have a documented security system or security process, um, mostly because you know we we sit on top of the cluster, can access eVPF and our uh, have deep access to your kernel. Uh, so security is a pretty important part of our system, um, and you know we we regularly do security reviews and uh, 
have waiver of reporting security incidents or issues. Uh, we're also tracked on flow monitor, uh, required we have a uh, perfect score on there, uh, and also uh, the open access at best practices. Uh, here's a list of like the major repositories for Pixie. Uh, we're primarily a monitor repo, so almost everything is inside of Pixie IO Pixie. So all the components are in there. Uh, the API, uh, we have a thing that actually copies over all the API code from our main repo. So if someone wants to use the API, they don't have to import all of our code. Uh, makes it a lot easier for like dependency management. If you're like a downstream user, you don't have to like import all of the Pixie source code. Uh, Pixie has a plugin system. I think I kind of alluded to this a little bit, which is we allow you to like export uh, hotel data. Um, and the plugin system can define like a preset um, set of like Pixie scripts and um, uh, results you want to see and be able to egress on some other system. Uh, so anyone can contribute to the Pixie plugin system. And if you do that, you'll show up as a accept plugin in, in our in the UI. Uh, and then it can get activated. Uh, so this is what like folks like VMware and others are planning to do to be able to like the data over to their systems for further analysis. Um, our websites. So we have uh, three major websites. Uh, the first one is px.dev, um, which is like our homepage. Um, and then there's docs.px.dev, which has our documentation, um, pretty extensive documentation uh, where we can fix the, and then the last one is the blog, uh, where we occasionally do like community blogs and um, on here about items related to Fixy or the community, uh, like eBPF or Kubernetes. Uh, and those are all posted over here. Uh, and they're all uh, hosted by Netlify. Mm -hmm. uh, there's stuff over here about how the issue tracking works. It's pretty, pretty vanilla issue tracking. We use GitHub for everything. Uh, we have different kinds, just like they typically do in Kubernetes um, and priorities and triage statuses. Um, all of our version history is documented. Uh, we have a lot of good and integration tests. All changes are reviewed. Um, we basically run all the all the tests and lint uh, pre pre commit. And then when the PR is merged in, we typically do another uh, set of tests where we also do like coverage analysis and stuff like that in the main main branch. Um, and then there's some manual steps in the release process. Uh, we, we try to automate more and more of these, but you know, there's just some stuff like where you click around the UI and how uh, validate things. Matt, do you have a question? Yeah, do you want me to hold questions till the end and let you get through this? Oh, no, 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 I'm happy to take them on the fly. Uh, okay, I was just wondering uh, on the CI and the testing side, um, is that done with GitHub Actions or something in the open or is it on private systems? And if someone were to make a fork of the project or want to contribute to the project, rather, would they be able to replicate the CI and the testing locally, or does it involve requirement or requiring like resources back at Pixie home base? Yeah, so we use a combination of GitHub Actions and Jenkins. Um, so our Jenkins is completely open to the public to use and look at. Um, the only thing is that if someone submits a PR to Pixie, uh, someone who's listed as a maintainer has to okay the PR before it gets tested. And that's just for security reasons. Um, we are moving- Yeah, and for cost attacks, I would imagine, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we are moving more and more stuff over to GitHub Actions. Um, one of the limitations that we actually have is um, dealing with the fact that some of our tests need eBPF to run. Like our integration tests, and those are actually pretty hard to run on GitHub Actions because GitHub Actions, well, one doesn't really allow us to have random machines with different kernel versions. Uh, we're actually moving away from that to using like QMU to run all of our tests because it's a lot more scalable and easy for folks to use. But GitHub Actions also doesn't support KVM, which makes it really hard to run QMU in any performing manner. Yeah, to be uh, clear, by the way, I wasn't, I, I, I forgot to, 
I, I'm not saying like you know the, the, the that GitHub Actions are 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 better or good or or are official or anything like that. But I was more asking. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we actually want to move more and more stuff over to GitHub Actions because that's on the CNCF project, and we'd rather have everything be completely over there rather than in some sure. private hosted cluster. So we we actually are trying to move everything over there. It's just some stuff is just very difficult these days because of you know lack of support for KVM and things about on GitHub Actions. Yeah. I, I'll I'll have to follow up to confirm this, so I'm not speaking out of turn. But um, I do believe also that um, we should talk about with with local with with GitHub Actions runners, and you know, and a combination of that and host incubation, if if that's the direction everything goes. We hope um, uh, the CNC, I'm not sure what resources are available out of, out of the CNCF Hardware Lab or not. I don't I don't speak for them, but no, will, so we've already we've already gotten stuff from the CNCF Hardware Lab, so that's part of our. Our plan is to move the GitHub like action to use custom runners. And then with that, we can use KVM and all that good stuff. Uh, so in terms of you know, folks running all the tests, every test should work locally. Um, like there's nothing that requires like a special hardware setup other than we need to be able to run KVM. So as long as you're not running a virtualized machine, or even if you are, as long as it supports KVM, uh, you can even run all of our integration tests locally. Uh, I'm working on like a PR right now where we move all the VPF tests to using QMU. So it just runs like any other test locally on your machine. Cool. I will leave that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Zane, uh, thank you for stepping through, you know, some of these details. So I had a few questions. First of all, um, you mentioned that, um, again, you know, the, um, there, there are fifty plus contributors now to the project who are active, you know, when working on, on the stack. Um, how many of those um actual like have maintainer rights? Um, is that, I mean, I'm assuming it's a subset. Yeah, only only three people right now have maintainer rights. Okay, and um, and what's the diversity of the organizations? That is, are they uh, all from the same organization, or are they? From multiple orgs. Correct. So all the maintainers right now are from the same organization. Uh, Dom, who was going to be another maintainer, actually who used to be at Twitter, but he moved over to Google Live. So he's technically <laughs> okay. in the same organization. Um, we we're probably going to move um, one of the folks from VMware or WSO2 to maintainer status, uh, possibly both. Yeah, I think I think that might be a good thing because uh, again, I, I think this question will come up later again, and and also you know um, really in terms of long term sustainability of the project, uh, it's a good thing to continue to cultivate and encourage new folks to join us yeah. uh, or become maintainers, right? Track towards yeah. being maintainers. So absolutely, I mean that's been our plan all along, and so we were cultivating some maintainers, but I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, we were a little bit too effective in cultivating. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, again, uh, that's always the case, right? Like, do you do you hire everybody into New Relic, or do you do you actually, uh, yeah. you know, maintain that diversity? So, I mean, that's something to just keep in mind. The other the other question I had was, um, is you meant, mentioned the control plane, you know, in the architecture as well as Vizier being used for. Um, Usual visualizations is that is that part of the code base that is on GitHub now, or is that a different part? Um, everything I'm talking about is on GitHub. So okay. the control plane, uh, the backend, the CLI, they're all on GitHub. Okay, very cool. And and is is Vizier also a component of Pixie, I'm sorry, I don't know. Yeah, so I, I, I kind of was going a little bit back right here, but let me skip over to these slides so I can go find make more sense. Awesome, awesome. Um, so there's the UI, CLI, and API at the highest level. Right. Uh, there's Pixie Cloud, uh, which I said we we're trying very hard to rename it to the control plane, but since literally everybody who works on it calls it cloud, and most other people refer to it as cloud, it's uh, we keep we keep calling it cloud in various places. <laughs> Um, but the reason we want to re rename it is it gets confusing, right? When, you, when people say Pixie Cloud, they think it's like a hosted paid offering or right, something. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, and that's not the, the intention here. So this is the open source control plane. Okay. Um, okay. okay. And then the stuff back here, the collector, aggregator, and the Pixie Edge module compose of 
uh, what we call the data plane, and that's basically the VIR. So the two largest right. components are the control plane and the data plane. Uh, since we don't actually send any of our data to the cloud, uh, we kind of have like a completely like separate architecture for them, right? So the control plane basically manages like the, the monitoring fleet and the UI. And Vizier is basically the, the part that gets deployed on every single cluster. Oh, okay, okay, very cool. I see. That's very, I mean, that's that's a great explanation because I think that the names probably are a little confusing unless, you know, they're clearly uh, exactly, yeah. related to. So the easiest way to split it is the data plane and control plane. Okay, um, yeah. great, great. And is the is the API also versioned and released yep. separately or? Yeah, so the API is already is our, um, is versioned and released separately. Um, so we specifically also break out like the Go API package. So if you're trying to like import it in Go, you can just like import our API package and sort of import it all actually. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you only need the dependencies for the API and not the dependencies that we need. Oh, cool. Okay, so it is it is very similar to what even Otel has implemented, where you can we can you, you can just yeah. bind with the API and uh, and then run with it. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, um, and there is a there are basically in terms of the API, there are two different APIs. There is the API to talk to the control plane and an API to talk to the data plane. I see. Uh, they're part of the same package. Um, but you know, there's like essentially like the control plane stuff is all about like management. Like I want to delete this cluster or add this cluster or whatever you want to mm -hmm. do. And then the data plane stuff is about querying the cluster. Makes sense. Okay, very very cool. Thank you for uh, going through that detail. Um, again, I think that the um, the other area that I would like to um, you know ask you to consider when you um, you know, uh, chat with the TOC uh, for for uh, incubation is to actually have uh, some form of a roadmap published, even if it is just you know major milestones that you want to see accomplished on the project as we go forward, right? Because one of the questions that does come up is what's next, right? In terms of feature set yep. as well as community. So we do have that actually. Uh, so there's a high level roadmap here, and then we have a detailed roadmap, which currently have in like a Google Docs format that's as if we're trying to move over. Yeah, to that's good. Um, so we do we have to broken up the area by like which part of the project it affects, and then here are the the things that we want to work on. Very cool. And and is this something that then relates to issues that are, you know, right. yeah. being tracked in GitHub because that might be useful also to for folks to get involved in specific, um, yep. areas you know driving the design or implementation. Yep. So there, there's basically a good issue for all the major roadmap items. Okay. Um, mostly because a lot of them are operationally reported by folks in the community. Um, mm -hmm. that we yeah. like promoted to like a roadmap item. Um, cool. So then we have a list of like all the major. We have a lot of external devs. We there's an entire like S bomb to look at um, for for everything. Uh, so we publish an S bomb with every release, nice. including all the licenses. Um, but um, you know, at a high level, other CNCF projects that we work with are like things like NATS and Jetstream, OpenTelemetry, etcd, and uh, OLM are the major projects that we rely on. Very cool. Um, we have a list of all the the authors and um, some of the adopters who, um, uh, you know, basically we have an adopters page that we allow people to submit their names for if they want to get listed. Mm -hmm. Uh, like I said, all the main right now, there are three of us. Uh, we're all on New Relic. I'm the only one that holds a double affiliation, actually. Um, so, uh, but other than that, um, uh, you know, we are working on adding um, maintainers from outside of outside of New Relic. That's part of okay. one of our main things. Um, community meetings. Then we have. We have a Twitter profile, which I think all these credentials are shared with CNC out. Uh, there's a YouTube channel. Uh, I talked about the website. Um, I kind of talked about how we fit into the ecosystem, right? We do real time data capture. Uh, we then allow you to send it over to like Prometheus or Telemetry. Um, and then at a high level, uh, we have a roadmap listed here. Um, 
Pixie is using production on like thousands of clusters. So like our biggest part of our roadmap is, you know, almost always like increasing the surface area of things that are supported, right? Like there's almost always some like special thing with some weird Kubernetes distribution that doesn't work um, or fixing some like potential data collection issues with some frameworks. Uh, so it's almost always like increasing coverage or reliability is like our number one item. Um, with the exception of that, um, you know, we've been working on things like um, expanding support for uh, like ARM, for example, this is one of the things that we're planning to release in the next week or so. Awesome. Um, so it'll is basically- this, Is like this specifically uh, including Graviton support also, or is it uh, ARM in general? It should work for any ARM CPU. Okay, pretty cool. And will there um, be um, test suites that are released, uh, you know, for each one of these profiles, hardware profiles? Yeah, that's kind of the goal. And that's part of the reason that, you know, one of the things we've been doing is like moving over um, kernel and low level testing, the QMU, because that basically allows us to like test like specific CPUs and make sure that they work. Um, so we can have like a test for like Graviton and one for like Ampere or something, make sure that those all pass. Yeah, cool, cool. That's great. I think that'll be uh, really well received by the logic community. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's it's quite a bit of work to, uh, to move over the BPF code to work. And also oh, yeah. Pixie's code is like mm -hmm. more than 50% in C++, which actually turned out to be pretty okay to port, but it's mostly the BPF code that was, that was annoying to move over to ARM. Yeah. So did you have to, uh, uh, I mean, is that extension also written in C++? Yeah, it's all uh, porting there. each one of these profiles. Yeah, basically. Okay, cool. Um, I mean, that makes sense because it's much easier to write that layer in yep. C++. So. Yeah, and you know, some of it obviously is in the BPF code. There's some like annoying if that's the that's the way of BPF plant. Cool. And and is there any um, thinking around performance benchmarks that um, you yes. may want to publish? Is that uh, yes. something? I so think glad, glad you asked about that. Um, so James has been pretty actively working on building up the performance testing suite. So partly what we're going to do, and I think this will get out in the next week or two, is that with every release and probably including the main belts, like every occasional main belts, because it takes a while to run, uh, we'll basically performance test um, all of Pixie to like know how much CPU it's using, what memory it's using, uh, what impact it has on the application that it's monitoring, like how much of that actually slowing down the application, um, and also um, uh, like coverage, like how much data loss do we have, right? Because mm -hmm. You know, we want to capture like 100% of the data, but we usually can't because of like practical trade-offs. It's usually like 99%, but we want to make sure it's not like 80%. Oh, that's great. Uh, so we plan, to, uh, we plan to publish that in like a public dashboard where you can just go view for like every release, like where the performance is tracking, similar okay. to what gRPC does. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I think that'll be huge. So is that something that you are, is the- uh, We're know, very, very doing? actively working on it. It's okay. actually, it's actually it's in done. It's in progress, okay. Uh, most of the code's actually checked in. Um, I think we are in like, we, we got a little sidetracked by uh, wanting to add an ARM support. So we're just going back and, and finishing that up now. Awesome, cool. So I uh, also, again, not to overwhelm the uh, with the number of questions but i also was interested in understanding if as a project you have put in uh any stability guarantees or published any st stability guarantees towards which you could say that um now you know this feature set is stable versus in beta or alpha right because again um typically adoption is very much driven by that and that was something that we ended up doing on hotel also right because again yep. it's just so we so, do do that okay um so we do have criteria for when something goes that's a lot of it has to do with the version numbering if something is below one like we reserve the right to change the api okay um although 
you know, like in reality, we have almost always given deprecation warnings for anything that we have changed. Uh, if you actually go through some of our documentation, like our table, uh, you'll actually see that like Kafka, for example, is marked as beta. Mm -hmm. um, so if you access this data set, you have to like add the dot beta labels. It's like very accessible, like very explicit that it's actually like a, a beta feature. Uh, and then once it gets stable and tested and we know that it's working, then we'll, we'll just remove the beta tag. Um, and then from that forward release, they can keep using it as a non-beta feature. Um, so yeah, we are pretty careful about that because once we know that once it's out, it's very hard for us to retract it back. Yes. Um, especially because it's very likely that New Relic will start using it in, in their <laughs> overall system. Um, or, you know, uh, Secret or one of the other folks and it'll be pretty painful for us to remove it. I mean, as a project, are you actually thinking about giving any kind of compatibility guarantees or is it just that, as you said, if, uh, you know, the versioning is less than 1.0, for example, then the API can change, right? I mean, uh, yeah, so we actually have compatibility guarantees. Michelle, do you know if we actually publish that in our docs or if we just like maintain it internally and not tell anyone about it yet? <laughs> uh, it might be internal, but we should definitely publish it. Yeah, I mean, that that would definitely be helpful because um, often, you know, just as you are seeing um, the new Relic teams absorb that and adopt that for, you know, feature sets rolling out on the service side, typically also other, you know, end users who are rolling out infrastructure based on Pixie could be, would also look at it, right? So I think that- Yeah, that I think people ask us this. and then we send it to them when they- uh when they really ask us about it but okay like we don't want people to rely on it below 1.0 but we almost always i think it's like two months or something when we make like an api change we'll keep the old one working but you're right we should probably just publish it and and deal with that <laughs> yeah i mean because again you if you you know say that hey you know we are going to maintain compatibility uh backwards compatibility for the last three releases for example right or, or yep. minor minor releases or you know, then say so because um, it's easier to say that than to assume that, you know, it's backward compatible forever, for example, yep. uh, even if it hits uh, one daughter, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So we should, we should definitely publish that. So we already have a doc on this, so we can probably just add that to our docs. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would recommend that because it's yep. just easier from an um, adoption perspective. It really helps. Yep. Awesome. Cool. And uh, that, was, that was basically uh, it. Yes, Sorry, please go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Because um, so I wanted to just like quickly run through like a demo, like a five minute yeah, demo. Please, so that please do. Yeah, please do. Yeah, good. Yeah. Um, so at a high level, you know, Pixie is purely edge based, right? So we run on the nodes and um, uh, on the Kubernetes cluster, and that's where all the data is stored. Uh, the main thing that does all the data collection is called the PEM, which stands for the Pixie Edge module. Uh, it runs on each of the hosts as a daemon set. Uh, inside the PEM, we have this EBP data collector, uh, some data storage, our querying system. Uh, we basically set up eBPF probes and collect the data and send it back. Um, we don't just use eBPF. eBPF is one of the things that we use. Uh, there's many other things in the Linux kernel that we actually use for data collection. Uh, because eBPF isn't, you know, the best thing to use for, for all the data sources. Um, and we also allow you to do things like that custom eBPF code. So I'll, I'll kind of demo some of those functionality. Um, so kind of like our three premises are auto tooling for using eBPF, edge compute, and then having structurable stuff. Uh, we have a full-fledged UI and a CLI uh, that you can access all the data with. Uh, in terms of the data collection, this isn't like an extensive list, but it kind of covers most of the main things that we do collect out of the box, um, which is you know things like all the basic process stats that you're probably used to, uh, stats about all the network interfaces and what traffic is flowing, what connections are being made. Uh, protocol tracing actually goes like one level deeper and it kind of traces the application level protocol. So you can get things like HTTP, uh, gRPC, uh, like HTTP2, right, gRPC. Um, like Kafka, SQL, whatever. So you can actually see details of those protocols. 
Uh, there's a CPU profiler, which is UPF. Uh, so you can see all the, the, the live CPU profiles. Excuse me. Uh, BPF traits, which allows you to insert custom BPF code. Uh, and then dynamic logging, which allows you to add like custom logging things. So we're about to mark this as a, this was an alpha feature. And we decided that we probably no longer want to support this. So this will probably get updated in the future. Because uh, I think the other things provide enough coverage. Um, Pixie is fully scriptable. Uh, so there's a Pythonic pandas like language. It's actually basically pandas. It allows you to go work with the data and be able to modify things, uh, run like machine learning models, whatever you want to do. Um, there have been some demos that uh, that I made on like using Pixie to uh, uh, you know, search like PII data or, or you know flag PII uh, issues in your in your data streams. Uh, our goal is to play with the ecosystem and not be like you know, competing with them. Right. So like I said, we, we have this very small niche that we target and we work with like open telemetry, Grafana and Prometheus. Uh, we have our own native UI, but we also have a Grafana plugin that basically does everything our native UI does probably better. Um, cause Grafana is a much more advanced ecosystem. Um, I can run through the demo real quick. Uh, so what I'll do over here is I will first switch over to the CLI. Let me just share my entire screen. Okay. So I'll first switch over to the CLI. Um, so normally the deploy Pixie, you download our CLI, find a Kubernetes cluster, um, and then you deploy it. Um, so I have a cluster here. Uh, let me make sure it's not. Okay, so I don't have anything Pixie installed on here. I do have this online boutique application installed. Um, so the first step I'm going to do is just deploy Pixie. Um, so you can deploy Pixie using the CLI. We also have a Helm chart and just like Kubernetes manifest. Uh, so there are a few different ways to deploy it. Uh, the CLI does stuff like make sure that it'll actually work right. We check all the kernel versions and uh, Kubernetes versions and things like that uh, to make sure that the deploy will actually succeed. But ultimately, we just apply the manifest, so there's nothing too fancy happening here. Um, so it says it's going to deploy to this cluster, uh, which is on GKE. Uh, great. So I hit yes. So there's a three-node cluster. It's installing the OLM, and then after that, um, it's going to start deploying Pixie. You can see it's installing the CRD now. Gonna give it like a few more seconds when it starts searching for the cluster. It's being ultra slow today, but. What I will do in the meantime, so this thing is going to keep running through the deploy. Um, but like most cooking shows, I have a cluster that's already deployed. Uh, we'll switch back to that cluster later and see that it's already been deployed. It takes about five minutes, so I don't want to like just sit there and make everyone watch that. Because <laughs> um, Kubernetes has to deploy all the services and wait for them to start and all the fun stuff. Um, OK, so once we land up in Pixie, uh, this this is like on the hosted version, but the open like if you deploy yourself, it's the exact same thing. Uh, this is actually running with only the open source code because you can see the open source logo and stuff over here. Instead, um, anyways, so once you load up Pixie, you'll immediately see like oh we discovered all of your services, all the connections between them, what traffic is flowing, how much traffic there is going between them, what the error rate is. Uh, we can pick like a specific namespace. So I can pick like sock shop, for example. And then inside of sock shop, I can see that there's a load test running, which is hitting the shop shop sock shop front end. And then that's basically creating a traffic to a bunch of downstream services. Right. So basically, once Pixie is installed without modifying any of your applications or adding any libraries, uh, we can use eBPF to collect all of those data for you. Uh, we've got things like 
here are all your latencies, like the P50, P99, uh, P90 latencies for your services. Uh, kind of like a high level view of like what the throughput latency and error rates are, all the pods that are running. Um, I'm going to just pick something in here, uh, like with the catalog service. Uh, actually, I'll put the card server. And we can go to a deep dive up here the HTTP request serving, how many errors we're seeing, latencies. Uh, we can see where the inbound requests are coming from. Uh, they're coming from a pod or a different IP address. Um, there's a sample of all the slow requests I've ever seen. So if you click over here, um, let me shrink this window a little bit, so I'll move the out of the way. Um, you can see over here that we actually capture the request in like full detail. So this is the pod that's making it. Here's the latency. It was a post method on this path. This was the body that we saw. Uh, and then here's the response body. So it does like full HTTP tracing. Uh, actually, we do full tracing from many different protocols where you can actually see exactly the request going in, the request coming out. Um, we do have capabilities to mask PII data, and we also have capabilities to dis disable people viewing the data in the UI. Uh, so there's a question uh, from Daniel. Yeah. Oh, I wasn't muted. That's bad. Um, so you mentioned you can mask uh, PII data. Um, and you also talked about these plugins. You might have covered it. My computer just crashed, so I apologize. But um, is there a way to import like uh, external artifacts? Or I assume you can't call like network code from your custom plugins because it's slow. But is there a way to import like let's say a map of what is considered PII, or to load all of my instances with let's say like a geographic descriptor as just like a contrived example, and then access those in these custom extensions? Yeah, so we don't currently allow you to run custom functions in our code. Mm -hmm. Like all the custom um, plugins can do is like run, they can run any pixel script. So one thing I didn't show mm -hmm. is like all these UIs are basically backed by some pixel script. Mm -hmm. So which is essentially Python, right? So you say like import PX and then go to town with whatever you want to do with the, the data and you can do like, you know, search for PII, whatever, mass PI, there are actually functions that do this. Um, I think what you're asking me is, can you import your own library? It's not currently supported, but one of the items in the roadmap is to add things like script versioning, which will allow you to add some of the custom import functions. So when you flag PII, if I run the flag PII function, you you have some sort of, or the Pixie project has some sort of, you know, structure that determines what is PII. And then I just yeah. import that, right? Okay. Exactly. So if you go look at, there's, um, on our docs, um, we have a list of all the uh, functions that we support. Okay. Um, if you go to like, sorry, it's not compile time functions, execution time functions. You can actually see a list of all the functions we support and what they do. And one of these mm -hmm. actually scans for PII and one of them actually has a mass PII in it. There's actually two versions of them. There's one of them that's faster that uses regular expressions. And there is one of them that uses like TensorFlow to actually search, like do a more comprehensive machine learning search. Got it. Okay, nice. cool. I don't want to derail us. Thank you. Yeah. And our, our goal is to be able to allow people to like import custom models and stuff, but it's not currently supported. Cool. Good to know. Um, yeah. So anyways, so we got to the point where we can see all the slow inbound requests. We can try to go debug them, take a look at what's going on. Uh, if you go to serving pods, uh, we can go into the next level of detail and to see what is this particular pod doing, you know, how much CPU is it spending, uh, is it reading through the disk, whatever, right? Um, and then I think one of the other features, oh, this is not, we only support, um, we only support um, continuous profiling in compiled languages or Java for now. Um, so I need to find a service that runs Java, which is probably catalog. Or, or some compiled language. Um, great. So one of the things we do is once you get to the pod level, you can actually see which functions are running and how much time they're taking. So this is actually like getting down to, um, you know, the code level where we can actually tell you how much time each one of the functions is taking. So normally, if you have like a performance problem, a lot of times you'll see like one of the functions is just like downloading. It's like much easier for you to go debug that. Um, like I said, this works for pretty much any compiled language and it works for Java. 
And if you look at the roadmap, we're planning to add support for like uh, Node.js and probably Python. So then, uh, um, then, a, then you would have three languages, Java, Node.js, Python, as the first three languages that are supported in terms of bindings? Um, no, because we also support right now, any compiled language will work. So Go, Go works for okay. example, Go. Okay. Uh, so right now it'll work for Go, C++, C, Haskell, whatever, as long as it's compiled. Um, and then Java. So the problem is that we don't know well, the way this works is that we basically sample the CPU stack every so often, mm -hmm. and we have no idea if it's like a, and we do this using ABPF, and we have no idea if it's like a dynamic language where it's actually executing. It's just some like random addresses. Sure. So normally it involves us having to go to the VM for it and then basically figure out what those random addresses map to. So we have the functionality built for Java where it basically goes to the JVM and it figures out what those random addresses are. Um, but we don't have that for, for Node.js and Python yet. Those are the only languages we can support for, uh, for this type of functionality. I see. Uh, but I think that covers, you know, just covering Go and Java, I think covers like a large part of the, the ecosystem yep. uh, for, for dynamic profiling. Yeah, definitely. Um, Again, like, you know, every single one of our UIs or things is like scriptable. So you'll be able to, you can actually create your own custom views if you want. And um, is this is this UI again, um, Pixie native or is it is it um, also exportable to Grafana as you were So we idea? have an export from like every script to Grafana. So there is actually a Grafana plugin which basically takes all of these scripts and then creates a native view in Grafana. Okay, so you can just use the scripts and just, uh... Yeah. Uh, you know, push it to a Grafana dashboard. All right, cool. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, we do have a native UI to the BB for us exploring stuff on there, but we also want to want to work with the ecosystem. Yeah. And it's pretty transferable. Yep. That's, uh, I mean, I think having the scripts that you can actually just use as the, um, even if you were to write a custom plugin and then just fit it into a different visualization engine it should work. Yep. Um, the last thing I wanted to quickly demo, um, uh, last couple of things. So like I said, we do, we do a bunch of different protocols. So if you're like, you want to see, well, if you want to see like Postgres data, for example, you can see all the Postgres queries that are running on this cluster. Uh, so all the script does is like, like show me the last thousand Postgres requests that run on this cluster. Um, we do that for like a bunch of different protocols. There's a comprehensive list in our docs. Um, so you can actually like, you know, do like outside monitoring for like a bunch of your, your infrastructure without ever having to go and like edit anything. Um, and then I think I also promised that I will show custom VPF code. So here is a, a functionality that never existed in Pixie, uh, which is the monitor, uh, TCP drops. Um, and what this does is it basically uh, looks for, this is a BPF script, which basically looks for every time a TCP connection drops. Um, and then this basically says, insert this trace point, uh, which is what we call it, as a TCP drop tracer, and then run it for 10 minutes. So this will run in the background for 10 minutes, collect a bunch of data for you. And then you can go ahead and like, you know, do things like look up the IP addresses or whatever you want to do, right? So it's basically doing an NS look up on the IP address and know where it's going. Uh, and then if it drops are greater than zero, it'll, it'll show it to you. Um, if I run this, this takes a little bit longer because it's actually trying to go and verifying that, oh, of course, this will not work. So Zane, I know why uh, this doesn't work. <laughs> what is the schema that uh, you're using internally? I mean, uh, again, it says preparing schema. So is that just JSON? Is it just formatting? No, so we use, we use Apache Arrow okay. uh, internally as our data store. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's basically what it's preparing. Uh, so is that, is that uh, in memory? Yes. Okay. That's awesome. Um, any chance you've got a flight server or planned for import ex for exporting data? I mean, if you're storing natively an arrow, that would just let you. Yeah, so we do want to do. Really 
we do want to do flight. So we do actually, so Pixie's use of arrow actually predates flight. <laughs> um, oh, I could. Okay. Oh, for, so for those not actually, familiar, for those not familiar, arrow is an in memory, very efficient data format. Um, that you can use instead of other things. Uh, and flight is a thin RPC layer that's somewhat new out of the Apache Arrow project to allow for bulk moving data really quickly. And there are then things like flight SQL built on top of it. Sorry. Yeah, I I was fairly involved with the Arrow project with Wes McKinney when I originally started. It's, it's actually like a, a stuff that I worked on at Trifacta many, many years ago. Um, so I was pretty familiar with Arrow. And our, our use of Arrow actually predates flight. So we actually have our own implementation of it on gRPC right now. And one of the items that we have is actually to convert it to flight so that we don't have to maintain our own, own implementation. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's one of those things that since we uh, predated it, it, we had our own, uh, own, own hacks to make it work. So I know why they... Uh, TCP job didn't work, so hopefully you won't judge me too long. They removed that particular function in the latest kernel, and I'm running a new kernel on this cluster. Um, but I will show you another one, which is this is going to snoop exec calls in your cluster. So every time something executes, they'll basically flag it, and then it'll show you a table with every single exec call that's running. Oh, there. Apparently, no matter what your cluster is doing, it's running a bunch of exec calls all the time. Um, so for example, you know, it's running run C uh, with these arguments. Um, so this is something that people might want to use if they're trying to like audit what binaries are getting executed. And this function will basically capture every single binary that ever gets executed. Uh, there's functionality that doesn't exist in Pixie. Same way we have this code that says, look for every time it gets into exec and then record a bunch of stuff about it. Um, that's kind of it. If I jump back to my terminal, um, look, it's finished deploying, so I should be able to see. Go back to my original cluster. Oh, look, here's my new dev cluster that I had. It's already collected all the data about what's running on there, and you're seeing the online boutique with the only application that's running. Um, I've got a quick question, so just to sort of to help folks understand sort of how to place this in their mental model of the Batman utility toolkit <laughs> that everyone has um, uh, to do their various stuff. Uh, you showed an example of capturing exact calls, right? So like if one wanted to say reconstruct process trees and then look at that, like what forked off what, what created what, uh, would that be something that would be done best in Pixie using you know, using the script facilities built in and or custom EVF, or would you see like Pixie as the data collection piece and then analysis on that exact data, you know, to reconstruct process trees or to do whatever else you're doing? Would you see that better done outside of Pixie where Pixie's really collecting the data and then the analytics happen elsewhere? Or do you see Pixie and are you positioning it as a place where, where one would do both of those things or, or somewhere in between? Um, I'd say it's actually somewhere in between. So we actually prefer the analytics to be done in Pixie because that usually means that you can egress less data out of your cluster, right? Because like you don't want to like egress like every single thing out normally. So the way we think about this typically is what kind of analysis can we do on Pixie to reduce the amount of data that leaves your cluster? Also potentially to anonymize it or remove PII data because you might not want to ship that somewhere, you know, else. So like the process tree analysis, you'd probably do that in Pixie because we have a lot of information. We can do things like join multiple tables and stuff together. So that's usually pretty efficient and fast to do. Uh, we do pretty much everything that Arrow and Pandas can do. Cool. Yeah, very cool. Uh, I mean, Zane, thank you again. This is a really good walkthrough and, and I think lots of content for also the TS, TOC to catch up on. It's good to, for them to kind of have a good uh, overview. Uh, and I really I appreciate one. you taking the time. Uh, I, I think I, we're at I, time. So Matt- I know we're at time. Know. It's a quickie. It's a follow-up from last time you were here, Zane. <laughs> okay. uh, did you guys implement authorization and, and RBAC? We don't have table level uh, RBAC yet. Uh, we do have like you know normal authorization, including API keys and deploy keys and everything now. No, uh, and we do have separation between them. Yep, but uh, we don't have like once in, like, do, do you have like different levels of access, 
to different levels of data? Or no, no, like everyone asks about animal? that. We have only very, very first control. Like we can stop everyone in the cluster from accessing like PII data, but we don't have like, uh, you know, this user group can access it, but this user group can't. Cool, thank you so much. Yep, yep. thank you. Jose. Thanks again. This is awesome. And and again, you know, um, I think one of the things uh, we can circle back and we should uh, is again, help with the anything you need on, you know, following up with the DOC. Uh, and also any other, you know, uh, areas that we can support you on. Yeah, I think we're still looking for a sponsor. So I, I don't know how that process works. I think that's like a big thing for us. I think uh, uh, we can definitely follow up on that also, because um, uh, there are, you know, uh, specific observability sponsors from the TOC, uh, but uh, it changes, you know, from every every year or so we'll we, we can also find out how again i'll take an action item to follow up with the doc and find out yeah that, and, that process has changed slightly in the last year um yeah one wants q a to continue uh we've got the, our slack channel uh, i won't i won't promise zane will be there uh immediately after this but um <laughs> but you feel free to continue the conversation online yes absolutely and and then you know how yeah, to, I'll, I'll how about, to find yeah. us we're <laughs> just ping us on Slack if you need anything. Awesome. Yeah. So we've also, uh, we're also in the process of converting that to like our due diligence doc because I've seen a lot of projects do that. Yeah. So we can enter in more, more information. So we're going to try to do that. Uh, we don't want to like rush anybody or, or like bother people too much, but we just want to like keep the process rolling. Yeah, exactly. And then maintain that momentum. So again, if you need a review or, um, you know, anything, please just ask. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks again for everyone for taking time. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Yep. Bye. Perfect.